in the court of the Gentiles. You could not go into the court of the women, definitely not into the court of the Israelites. And so what that, what that means is this is a very strict rule. It was so strict that it says here in Acts 21, there was times when the Apostle Paul, right, uh, they see Apostle Paul in the temple, and they're very angry. They grab him by the shirt, and they're laying hands on him. And what are, they, what are they charging Paul with? They said, moreover, this Paul brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. So because of all the restrictions, these Gentiles were not allowed into those inner courts. And then because Paul didn't do that, but they're charging him with that. So this is a very serious offense. They supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple instead of leaving uh, this Ephesian named Trophimus out in the court of the Gentiles. This is what it looks like today. It is not a temple on the Temple Mount today. What is that? It is two Muslim mosques on the Temple Mount. Right? The, ter the second temple was destroyed in AD 70. So that big mosque is called Dome of the Rock, and then there's a smaller mosque called Al-Aqsa Mosque. And then uh, where all the Jews worship today is this place called the Wailing Wall. The Wailing Wall is the western wall of the temple. It looks very small. See that very small region? But in reality, it is this big. That tiny region is that big. So this wall is where all the Jews they worship, they pray there today, they put papers inside this wailing wall because this is the last remaining structure from the original temple. The temple was a sacred place. It was their main gathering for worship. And only what's left is this wall, so they have no choice. Israelites and Jews are not allowed to go on the Temple Mount today. Only Muslims and tourists can go up there. So this is the men pray on the left, and the women pray there on the right. And so what that means is that in terms of what Jesus wanted is this is supposed to be a house of prayer. This, this structure that it looked like is supposed to be a house of prayer. But what is happening is that in this court of the Gentiles region, this is supposed to be a prayerful place. They have nowhere else to go. And what is there when Jesus walks in? He finds countless stands, countless booths and merchants. There's lots of loud noises. There's noises of money being exchanged. There's noises of animals. There's animals and their feces and their smell. And all of this is happening in the court of the Gentiles where it's supposed to be a worshipful place. And Jesus is so upset at this. Imagine coming to church or going to a sacred place, and instead of finding a place where you can really focus on the Lord, you find merchants. You find a Shirlin night market. Imagine if instead of having these nice chairs, we all brought in like Shirlin night market stands, and they're all throwing the dice and selling sausages, and you're all trying to worship God. Wouldn't you be furious? I'd probably be fired, right, the next day. <laughs> That's how bad it is. And they didn't realize the inner courts were fine. The court of the women were fine. The, the court of the Israelites were fine. Why is it that just because it's the court of the Gentiles, you allow all these merchants to come in, and what has defiled the place is not the Gentiles, is these merchant, merchants. Merchants. So the first thing that Jesus encounters in the cosmos is this selfish understanding of oh, we only care about the Israelite people. We don't care about the worship and the prayer life of these Gentiles because we fill their space with booths. They could have put these booths anywhere else, down the stairs, somewhere in Jerusalem, in the city, anywhere but in the temple. The second thing that Jesus encounters when he encounters cosmos in the temple is greed, right? This is greed not just from the money changers, from the merchants and the priesthood, all of it to together. All of it together put in a way that could be taken advantage of. So this is what it would look like. 
Uh, Jesus says, he quotes Jeremiah 7, 11, 7, 11, has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your eyes. Behold, I have seen it, declares the Lord. And this is one of the worst things to say about the temple because Jeremiah 7 is a passage about the leaders have gone corrupt. So when Jesus is saying it's become a den of robbers, it is not just some random phrase. He's quoting Jeremiah saying, the leaders in this temple are corrupt. This is a very, very challenging, very bold statement to say. And how, what is the justification for him saying that? So this is the shekel that would have been used. Um, that can be used for the temple tax. And the way that the temple tax used was annually, um, all the Jews had to bring, uh, ha- they had to pay a temple tax, which is half a shekel. Um, so they would use these coins. And the reason why they had to have money changers, like an exchange, is because the temple doesn't take other coins. Other coins have, um, you know, Caesar on them and other sort of inscriptions that say Caesar is Lord. But to them, this would be blasphemous to use this kind of coin in the temple. So you have to change it into a coin where, where they allow, right? We can't have any other inscriptions. Only God is Lord. So they have these money changers. They also found eventually some of these other coins that looked like this. And that's how small it would be. They have to change it to these, these shekels. Uh, so not only the money changers would get money, right? Because they, have you ever gone overseas where you have to exchange money? And you're like, okay, should I exchange at the airport or should I exchange at the bank? And you're always trying to find the, the best exchange rate. These are the, this is, you go to the temple tax and they have a monopoly on the exchange rate. And so good luck trying to find a good rate, right? They're all in it together. They're all in cahoots. You can't get a fair rate. They're going to make a commission. They're going to make a killing off of the money changing system. And then what's more, you take these mo- this money that you've ex- exchanged, and then you go and you buy different animals. Why would you buy different animals? Because these people are pilgrimaging from very far away, right? So they're here to offer different types of sacrifices. In the Jewish s- sacrificial system, you had pigeons, you had doves, you had sheep, you had bull, right? It depends on the type of sin that you are trying to atone for through this blood. And so it's really hard to come from so far away bringing a bull, right? So what they would do is they wouldn't bring anything. They would just buy the animals at the temple. And these animals are unblemished. The money is acceptable to God. The animals are acceptable to God. And so, again, when they go, they exchange money. They're gouged one time. And they go and they buy these animals. They're gouged another time. It's so exorbitant. One time I went to watch like a, a, a game at Canada Place and I brought a Coke. Okay, I drink Coke. I used to drink Coke. Okay, I still drink Coke. <laughs> and I brought, this, I brought this brand new bottle of Coke and then we had to go through security at, at this sports arena and they said, you can't bring this in. I said, why? It's unopened, it's perfectly fine. They said, no, so they made me throw it away. Perfectly good bottle of Coke. And then they just threw it in the garbage. I was like, what a waste. And then I went into the arena, and then I bought an exact same bottle of Coke. It's like four times the price. That's why they don't let it in. So that the people inside the institution can make the money. If they let everyone bring it in, then inside the temple, they wouldn't make money. So they're gouged then as well, and they might have been gouged even a third time because they can't even go into the temple courts. So they get this dove or this pigeon, and then it's sacrifice, or this sheep, and they don't even know for sure if it was sacrifice. I was doing research, and reports are, hey, maybe they would take this money, they would pretend to splatter this blood, and then they would say, oh, your sin has been atoned for, and then they would resell the sheep. It's corruption upon corruption. The people who've come in penitent, in, with penitent hearts, they've come to the temple and they want to worship God. They want to atone for their sins. They're, they've met with a marketplace. They're gouged. They're, they're ripped off of all, this, uh, their, all their belongings and their money. And Jesus is furious. 
what he finds there is not, is not a sanctuary for God's people to worship. What he finds is a refuge for robbers and thieves. These people would pay three times, four times what it would have been normally. Okay, I'm getting a little bit worked up, but. <laughs> and what is Jesus' response? Jesus' response is he is very upset. He has what we call a righteous anger. Now, what kind of anger is this? Why I asked you if your anger was righteous or not, right? A lot of times people say, you know, Christians can't get angry. Like, can a Christian get angry? Of course, right? It's like, oh, Christians can never get angry. The, pro the, pro the problem with these different angers is there's different types of anger, right? There's t one type of anger, which is very selfish anger. It's like, oh, I'm going to get upset at every little thing that someone says at me, every little happening, and then I focus all on myself, and th that's a very selfish type of anger, right? So the Bible would also talk about it like this. My beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, right? So we're not talking about Jesus being very fast to anger. This is obviously something so atrocious. It is not just a, a whim. It is not just a thing that he felt, right? And so what should Christians do when we feel angry? Should we just bottle it up and like just, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm just not gonna tell anyone and then the one day explode. That's not very healthy either, right? So Jesus is very upset, and his, uh, his anger is a righteous anger. God wants us to be angry, and we are right to be upset about sin and injustice. We should take a stand against it. Unfortunately, Christians are often very passive about such important issues, issues that we should be getting angry over. And instead, we just think about anger, about these petty insults and petty irritations. What are the deep things of God that Christians should be angry over? Anger as it's, at itself, as an emotion, is not morally good or bad. It's an emotion that can be destructive, but it can also be used to produce good if it is harnessed in the right way as Jesus did. So event... And then Jesus has this zeal. This is his, his second part of his response. He's angry, but he's angry because he has zeal. He has zeal for his father's house. It says here at the end of John chapter, uh, in John 2, 15 to 17, his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. This comes from Psalm 29. Zeal for your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. So what it means is that Jesus has this great passion to see the house, the temple of God, be a, a house of prayer. And it's this zeal, and he doesn't see that. That's why he's so upset. What did these people do wrong? What did they do wrong? My dad used to have this phrase. He would say, Joey, you have to do the right thing in the right time, in the right place, right? I don't know if you've heard that. And so what did they do? Did they do the right thing? I mean, it's very suspect, right? Probably not, but these services had to be rendered. Somebody had to exchange money. Somebody had to sell animals. So the act, the act of that service is not wrong. Was it the right time? Of course it's the right time. It's during Passover. What they did wrong is the wrong place completely the wrong place. If you want to sell these things, you sell it over there. If you want to exchange this money, you do it outside the temple. You don't do it in the temple of God. Keep it clear of the temple. Is it a place of worship or is it a place of business? What Jesus was was against all of these businessmen making money, being corrupt because of this time. And that the people in leadership failed to understand the basic, most fundamental purpose of the temple. It was not a marketplace. It was not a business place. 
It always and always is meant to be a house of prayer. And Jesus was so upset because all these other things were obscuring the point. They were obscuring this authentic communion with God. Sometimes when we say preaching, when we learned, um, when I learned uh, about preaching, they said the goal of the preacher is to get out of the way of the text. Because the people here, they want to hear the word of God. They want to understand the Bible. And if the preacher is in the way, we're doing the word a disservice because we're, we're detracting from people's worship of God. And so he has this zeal. He's not, like it says in Revelation 3, against this church because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. So the conflict comes, right? You have this institution doing it one way and Jesus challenging them, overturning the, the tables. I was... Uh, at, a, at a tournament uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking with a coach on the side of the street in Taipei, and there was a, a, a man got out of his car, and he was yelling, yelling really loud at an a, other guy in front of him in a car. He got out of the car, was banging on his window, yelling at him, all these like really loud curse words, and this coach was like, what is this? When you have this commotion, that was just one person when Jesus did this, imagine the shock. Imagine everyone is turning. He's turning these tables over. There's, there's coins falling everywhere. And all these tables, he's turning them over. In one account, he has a whip. He makes a whip out of cords, and he's whipping them. He's getting them out, getting out of my temple. It's hard to imagine, but please, like, think about it. It's not some, oh, I'm going to... In Chinese, like they he like takes a table and he just tosses it upside down. And what happens? How do they respond? They're like, Lord, Messiah, we're so sorry. You're right. We repent of our ways. We should not be doing this. We should do it in a proper way. We should take all the booze and put it outside. Is that what they said? The chief priest and the scribes and the principal men, these are the leaders of society, were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. The chief priests and scribes were seeking a way to destroy him because they feared him, and all the, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. Why would, they, why would they want to kill Jesus? The Messiah has come. Yeah, but he damaged their business. He hurt their income. Jesus preached against injustice. He challenged the rich. He elevated the poor. But they feared this losing power. They feared a public uprising. And this happens today all the time. Look, all the, if you challenge these institutions and leaders, this is what happens. When Jesus heal, heals legion, uh, heals the man of the legion, and it goes into the pigs and the pigs all die, do they, are they happy? They say, Jesus, please leave because you hurt our economy. You hurt all the pigs we could have sold. They didn't care about the kingdom. They didn't care about the welfare of this human being. They cared about their own pockets. So what is... What is, I'm going to skip that. So what is that today? As we know, the temple on the Temple Mount does not exist. The temple today is more equivalent to what we call the church. The church is this Greek word called ekklesia, as you know. Um, it has, in one way, in one function, as we mostly use it today, church is a place, right? Usually say, I'm going to meet you at church, right? And it's a place of worship. It's a place of fellowship. Really, in actuality, what the church has become biblically, biblically, the church is not really a building. 
And the church is not even supposed to be an organization. The church, ecclesia means called out. So the church is a group of people called out of their homes to gather, and they're called out to live their lives for Jesus. So the church is not, oh, a, a place where we can gather. The church has always been about em empowering and equipping a group of people. The church is a, a people group who have a true worship to God, a, a group where there are heartfelt prayers. It's not about how big the building is. Is Are these people praying? Are these people worshiping? Is there a filling and an anointing of the Holy Spirit? Who cares how big the building is? Are people getting closer to God? Are they being filled with the Holy Spirit? Is there penitence? Is there repentance? Is there the gospel being preached? That is where there is true power. The church should not be a marketplace. It should not be focused purely on finances. The things that we should never compromise as a church are the love for God, our love for Jesus Christ. A church should never, ever compromise that. But what's happened is a lot of churches are so full of merchants. Merchants. You go to worship God and you hear bleeding sheep and pigeons and loud noises. What is the purpose of our worship service? To worship God. You tell your kids, you tell your friends, why do, why do we sing? To worship God. Why do, why do we need to go to church? To worship God. Why do we tithe? To worship God. And why do we serve? To worship God. The Christian life is a life dedicated to God. It is also a, a body of Christ, a group of believers. It is not confined in, into four walls of a building. When you leave this space, we are still Grace Church. And so it is not just about the activities that happen in the four walls. It is about equipping the people. We are the temple of God. We, the, the Holy Spirit abides in us. So what are the, when you hear this incident, who do you think, who do you relate to most? And what makes your blood boil today? What tips can we learn from Jesus' example? So I'm going to end with five applications for us. Hopefully we'll get through all these. The first application. Jesus does not accept everyone's actions and decisions. I know this is kind of a shocker because today a lot of people expect Christians, right, to say, oh, Jesus loved everybody, and Jesus is all about love. The gospel is all about love. We've got to love and accept everybody. Really? Jesus didn't do that? Did Jesus accept these actions done by these money changers and where they were? Did he accept, like, these merchants filling up God's temple? So was Jesus not being loving here? What is, what is the actual application if Jesus was so loving, oh, why didn't he just allow these money changers and, and these uh, merchants to continue in the temple courts? Hey, Jesus, you're being so judgmental right now. You're, you're, you're not accepting our life choices here. This hogwash, utter hogwash. The one that we follow, he was full of love, but he was also full of zeal for the house of the Lord. He would not compromise that. That came first. What is the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and strength, and then to love people as yourself. You have a certain order. We can't get it wrong. You can't love people first and then love God second. Your entire worldview and your frame of mind will be incorrect. That's the first thing, is Jesus didn't accept everyone's actions and decisions. The second application, even in anger, Jesus did not sin. It says here, Ephesians 4.26, 
be angry. I used to think this would say, in, in your anger, do not sin. The, the, the Greek actually is a, in a command. This is the imperative form. So it's actually saying, be angry. <laughs> there are certain times, there are certain things, things in the world where you ought to be angry. There are certain situations where you ought to be angry. But it, when you're angry, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. I'm going to go kind of quick here. <laughs> the third application. Jesus still focused, even when he's angry, he still focused on his ministry and his people. He didn't stop doing positive things. So in his you know, driving out all these merchants, what's the one thing that stopped him? The blind and the lame came to him. He's so, he's busy, you know, casting out all these people. And then he stops. He stops his rampage because he saw blind and the lame coming to him. And he healed them. He doesn't dwell on the negatives of the situations. He understands that this is, this looks like a commercial center but it should be a place of healing, a place of prayer. And the healing part also points to another uh, affirmation of his identity. And so he stops. He teaches. He heals. And so this is the third application. There are times when you are right to be angry, but you can't stop doing the things that we're positively supposed to be doing. You can't just focus and ruminate on the negative Oh, this, this, I'm so angry about this that you forget to do your work. You forget to do the positive opportunities that you have to serve. Fourth thing we can learn from Jesus. Jesus had authority in this situation. This is very key. When we are dealing with the cosmos in, in righteous anger, a very key question to ask ourselves is, do I have any authority in this situation? Is there anything I can actually do? There are a lot of things that we look at the injustices in the world. We look at all the, the atrocities that happen in the world. I am very upset. But what, what can I actually do besides pray? What authority do I have for different situations? What authority do I have in Israel and Gaza? I have no authority there. What, what can we actually do? So when, when Jesus is there, um, he is healing and all these doing, doing all these wonderful things. The chief priests and the scribes see it. And the children are crying out in the temple. They're repeating. They're repeating this phrase, Hosanna to the son of David. And all these leaders, they're indignant. And they say to him, do you hear what they are saying? So what they're expecting Jesus to say here is, Oh, uh, oh, no, don't call me that, right? Instead, he says this. He says, yes. <laughs> it's like it's, it's one, one, one word answer. Do you hear what they're saying? Yes. <laughs> have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise? This is a reference to Psalm 8, right? Out of the mouth of babies and infants you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. And then so, who is Jesus to this temple? It's not another person's temple. This is my father's house. He, he's going to not just a place, not just some random place of worship. He's like, you did this in my father's house. This is his house. He has not only the anger, he has the authority to drive them out because you did this in my house. You can do that in any other house. I don't care. I have no jurisdiction here, but not in my house. You did it in my house. And he is furious. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? To Jesus Christ. And the fifth and last application is that Jesus left at the right time. 
At some point, he leaves, right? He leaves, he goes out to the city of Bethany to lodge there. And why, does he, why, does, why doesn't he just keep staying there? Why doesn't he just, I'm going to take over this place? He has to go. He has to go and be crucified. He has to do Passion Week. He has to rise again from the third day. He knows he's going to leave. He's going to come back. Surely I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. These are the final words of the Bible. So in our anger... If we have righteous anger, there is at some point we've got to understand we've got to leave it. There we can only do so much. We have to leave it. We have to trust God. We do the best that we can, but we trust God with the rest. So when Cosmos meets Jesus Christ, when in our anger... We don't need to accept everyone's actions and decisions, especially if they're wrongful, especially if they're hurtful, if they're sinful, if they're wicked. As Christians, when we are walking around this world, we do not need to accept that. In fact, it should make us upset. It should make us upset because the world that God has created is way better than this. We as humans are way better than this. When we walk around the world, we have the right to be upset when we see those things. But in our anger, we should not sin. We should not, like, I don't know, I don't know call people names or in, in all of the various things that we would do to sin, to make it a selfish thing about me, right? It's not about Jesus. It's about his zeal for God and his house. When we are angry, we don't put our blinders on. We focus still on our positive purpose. Yeah, you have things that you're upset about, but you can't neglect everything else that's positive that's going on in your life. You still got a job to do. You still got ministry to do. You still have people to take care of. You can't just ignore all of that in your anger. Ask yourself, what authority do I have? And what can I actually do about this? And do what you can and leave the rest to God. So what makes your blood boil today? <laughs> I would really, it would be so beneficial in your small groups or in your families or in your friends. Know this about each other. Know, know this about each other. What is it that you really have zeal for? And what is stopping you? If you have meet those five things, if you also have authority over that situation, what's stopping you? The world needs you in those situations to be an ambassador for Christ. It is not the time in 2024 for the church to be standing idly by. It is not in our purview or our mandate to just be more accepting of all the evil and wickedness around us. We have to let the world know there is still a hunger. There is still a hunger in this society for righteousness and justice. Let us pray. Father, thank you for the brothers and sisters and friends that you've gathered here. Thank you for this passage that we can enter into, understand why, Jesus, you are so upset. God, I pray that Grace Church, our space and our people, will be a house of prayer for all nations and that we'll, we will be a people of prayer. Forgive us, Lord, for any times we have focused on secondary and tertiary things. Bring us back to why we're even gathered here. It's to glorify your name. Thank you for loving us. Thank you that you gave us life and life abundant. Thank you for strategically putting each one of us in our communities, in our workplaces, in our families, that we can be the salt and light 
of the world. Father, I pray that we as brothers and sisters will encourage one another. We will look each other in the eye and know the impact that we're having, that we will pray for one another. Lord, return us to your design for your church. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.